This Talking Towns series is a collaboration between the Centre for Irish Towns and the UCD Earth Institute, and it is curated by Katrina Devery and Sarah Cottrell, who are from both places. So the reason we put them on is obviously to try and generate a conversation around the challenges facing our towns and the role of research and policy in addressing those challenges. The webinars are on the first Thursday of the month, which is correct for this month, um, and they will take place each trimester and they'll all have a different theme or focus. So the one in April is on the 6th of April, so please put that in your diaries. It's going to explore the circumstances, challenges and opportunities that making art presents for those living and working in and across rural areas. And the one on the 4th of May is a joint webinar and we have a lot of connections with Edinburgh. So this is a joint webinar with the University of Edinburgh. Um, it's part of this Nations of Towns collaboration that we have. Um, and it's going to be looking at the present and future of the high street or the main street, depending if you're in Scotland or in Ireland, um, in our towns. Um, so today, importantly, we are focusing on the theme of data and its critical role in helping us to understand and also to monitor our towns. Um, and actually data was one of the, the lack of quality data was one of the reasons that Orla Murphy and myself sort of set up CFIT. Um, we're very pleased to have three distinguished speakers with us. We have Phil Prentice, Ad, Adjua Ofuri and Dominic Fahi. And they're going to talk about different initiatives um, and projects that relate to data and towns in Scotland and Ireland. So the way this will work is as normal. I'll just give a very brief introduction to each speaker. Um, I'm going to go with the order from the poster. We're going to leave the questions and answers to the end. If you could put comments and questions in the chat, um, that's the best tool for us to use. It doesn't have to be beautifully crafted, but if you could make clear who the comment or question is for, that would be really helpful. Um, as you might have noticed, the, the webinar is being recorded. So we'll get on because we, we need to keep within the hour. So the first speaker is Phil Prentice. Uh, Phil is the Chief Officer at Scotland's Towns Partnership. Uh, Scotland's Towns Partnership is a, an entity that we're fascinated with in the Centre for Irish Towns. It's really interesting. It's kind of the go-to body uh, for Scotland's towns. It's a support agency for towns and it's a national towns collective. And it's quite surprising when you find out when you look at the amount of work that it covers, um, it's actually a very small, agile, not-for-profit, independent company, and it receives funding from the Scottish government. So it's quite a different setup to the Town Centre First Office that's been set up in Ireland recently. Um, in terms of Phil, his career spanned public and private sectors. Um, currently, he's, in addition to the role as Chief Officer of STP, he's the National Programme Director for Scotland's Improvements Districts. Um, he's on the board of Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, um, and he's the National Ambassador for Adopt and Intern. Um, Phil's a very regular visitor to Ireland, not least because he's a fellow Ulsterman, um, and he's advised and worked with Ali Harvey in particular and the Heritage Council's Collaborative Town Centre Health Check over the last, I suppose, three or four years. Certainly, um, Phil, I first met you at an event in Dundalk that um, the Collaborative Town Centre Health Check had organised called Strengthening the Ireland-Scotland Collaboration on Town Centres. So I believe today you're going to talk to us about the Understanding Scottish Places Initiative. So I'll hand over to you, Phil, if that's okay. Uh, thanks very much, Philip, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, it's lovely to be invited into a room where I will be able to understand all the accents. Uh, so, yes, I'm Chief Officer of Scotland's Towns Partnership. Towns Partnership was actually established on the back of the Scottish Government and Local Government Town Centre Action Plan, which was published in 2014. That was in recognition that Scotland is very much a nation of towns. Out with Glasgow and Edinburgh, basically all the rest are towns rural towns, coastal towns, island towns, central belt, post-industrial towns. So we needed, to th we needed to look at policies and build data and build resources that would actually deal with that issue. More than two thirds of our population in towns, uh, more than two thirds of our business base are in towns. So we really did need to start improving the piece. So STP do four things. We manage the towns platform. Uh, so everything from data, toolkits, resources, media, events, conferences, cross-party group in, in Parliament, funding, etc. We also have the Scotland's 
improvement districts. We have the most expansive improvement district program globally. We've got digital improvement districts, community improvement districts, park and city, tourism, food and drink, island, uh, park, industrial estate uh, improvement districts. So by far, we are the most expansive in terms of how we deploy business improvement districts uh, globally. We also run the Scotland Loves Local Initiative. Uh, coming out of COVID, we needed to think about recovery, but we also needed to think longer term about net zero and changing people's behaviour. So uh, we have a digital currency platform. We've seen local authorities buy you know, 10 million pounds worth of digital currency, which actually locks out the online extractors and forces people back into bricks and mortar. We've got all of the data and intelligence behind that. It's about a brand, it's about positivity, it's about localism and community, et cetera. And it has grown from strength to strength with a lot of corporates now adopting this as opposed to giving people Amazon cards, et cetera. The final thing we do is the policy on behalf of Scottish Government. We've just published a new feature for Scotland's towns. That's the new town centre plan. And that takes, it takes cognizance of what the post-COVID net zero landscape is going to be and also about the health and well-being economy. So we are taking a slightly different approach in terms of our policy moving forward. But roll back to the very start. Scotland is slightly ahead of the other nations within the British Isles. Uh, we did understand that we were a nation of towns and we needed to start doing more for them. And the starting point with all of that was to actually build an evidential platform. So the first thing I did when we established uh, STP was to bring everybody into the room, all of the key stakeholders, local government, Scottish government, the various community planning partnerships, agencies, community groups, etc., academia, private sector, got everybody into the room and said, look, what sort of data would be useful and what sort of tools would be useful as part of that? And that conversation led us to um, basically constructing understanding Scottish places. So in Scotland, we made a decision to develop a methodology that everyone would engage with. So we established that the, the geography would be settlement. That was the easiest, most logical geography to actually map onto the town. Uh, the second thing was all the socioeconomic indicators. So things like car ownership, home ownership, tenure, age groups, assets within that community, schools, dental practices, education levels, employment, all of the normal stuff you would get through the likes of census. So we, we again, went through a very detailed exercise with the stakeholders in terms of what type of information they would want. We then looked at uh, size clustering. So we used we used the K-means uh, clustering on locality size to actually start to build a comparability type model, typology model. So we were comparing like with like small, medium, large. And for the first time ever, we were able to give local authorities in particular a tool that allowed them to compare what their town was like with towns that were in different parts of the country, rather than just looking through the lens of their own local authority, it allowed them to look more broadly. And then finally, and very importantly, we built in an interrelationship model. Towns don't sit in their, in, in their own. They are, there are interrelationships with neighboring towns and settlements, et cetera. So we, we built in um, the interrelationship model with the Center for Local Economic Strategies. And we can even tell who, who comes into your town every day. Where do they come from? Who leaves your town? Where do they go to? So you can get a really good understanding of the form and function uh, of, of, of your town. So in addition to that, another important ask from the stakeholders was, we're fed up with consultants coming and doing these wee reports. This is your town, you need a wee strategy, da, 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 and they're all getting paid. £20,000 for giving them the same thing. So we actually developed a common audit tool, a town centre audit tool. Uh, the main tool for bigger towns captures 250 KPIs across seven different thematic areas. And these are all linked to sort of current Scottish government policy thinking. So it'll be about climate, about housing, about transport, about the economy, about uh, green space, etc. So that's a consistent way of gathering data. It means that I'm at the center, I've got the master dashboard and I can actually measure progress and change over a timeline. Uh, we also enable uh, the local authorities or the agencies uh, to do it themselves. So as part of that process, we give them a handbook that identifies all the data sources and uh, they can do an update of their audit as often as they, they, they please. Um, so that's the sort of 
and that's the sort of basic output. For smaller towns, we recognize you wouldn't need to be measuring 250 KPIs. So there's a 50 KPI thing for smaller towns. We made a decision that the geography in Scotland, normally town planners would class a town as being 3,000 people or more. But we had settlements with 1,000 people and they were actually quite critical, whether they'd been on a small island or in a coastal community. So we actually drew the line at 1,000. We have got 484 towns uh, with 1,000 people or more and every one of them has been built into that typology. There's roughly 60,000 pieces of data behind each town and it allows to give you an idea of the sort of deployment, for example, my political leader, when I used to work in local government, he would come to me and say, how come we've got such a successful town in Newton Mearns, two miles away in Barhead, it's really struggling. You know, can you not make Barhead like Newton Mearns? No, Barhead is a completely different thing. It's a post-industrial town. Uh, it's comparator towns or places like Renfrew or Trinent. Newton Mearns is a very wealthy middle-class commuting suburb, so we're not starting off in the wrong foot. We need to treat each town separately. And I think that's really important in terms of developing the economic strategy, prioritization, different approaches that are required. Uh, private sector. So the private sector use this tool very regularly, again, to look at clustering. So if they have a new store format and they try it in one particular town, the chances are within the cluster of said 12 or 18 other towns that are virtually identical they can actually go and expand that model out uh, in, in the similar towns. So house builders use it, the grocery sector use it. It is very well deployed by um, the private sector. Social sector use it as a conversation starter. You know, which towns, which other towns across the country are we like? Where do we do well? Where, do, where are we struggling a wee bit? So what are the key things that we need to do? It has won international awards in terms of being robust and credible. It doesn't create league tables, which is often very important because you want to encourage people, but it's very honest. It gives you a straightforward, honest depiction of what your town is, where it sits in its typology and all the key aspects about your town, whether it's green space, house prices, digital, household composition, access to assets. It tells you everything that you need to know to get a really good starting point and a baseline. As we then evolve, because a lot of it's census based, as we come through census upgrade and census renewal, which has happened last year, we do a comprehensive upgrade of the model, which normally takes about six months. Because of all the changes that have been happening across wider society, we are also looking at functionality. So we're bringing in some sort of real lifetime data. There'll be stuff about air quality, about car flow, about uh, counting people, uh, Data, uh, data around weather, you know, so there's going to be a live section and also working with Ordnance Survey, we're going to do a wee bit more mapping so people can get actually a physical depiction of their time, which is helpful as well. Uh, we're building in measures around health and well-being, around climate, around town centre living, the housing piece and uh, also about digital capacity. So that in a nutshell is where we are. We are in the middle of the rebuild because the census in Scotland was delayed for a year. So we need the, 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 the data to be cleansed further and brought down to local authority level. We anticipate that will happen probably by June. We then kick into the total rebuild mode and we hope to have a beta test version by autumn uh, and the full USP2 launched probably this calendar year around December time with all of the new functionality, all of the, um, the, the new data sets uh, in it and I anticipate we will have more than 484 towns because there have been new towns, there have been boundary changes, et cetera, uh, probably closer to 500. And we will have seen towns moving from one particular typology into another just due to different growth factors or e e even decline. Some places where Amazon, for example, have moved out, uh, will have shifted down a level because of the economic measures, et cetera. So it's a very powerful tool. It's pretty straightforward to actually develop. And we have also we have offered this to colleagues in Ireland. Uh, we don't need any commercial return on this. So all of the technology and all of the folk behind it are more than happy to share that with you as moving forward. That's me, Philip. Great, thanks, Phil. That was a, a whistle-stop tour of a, an amazing tool. I, I've used it myself. Um, and, and when you're talking, that what always strikes everybody is the similarities and the um, how interesting it would be to compare 
times in Ireland with times in Scotland if we had the same level of, of data up and running. Okay, so Phil, we're going to leave questions. I'm sure there's lots of questions um, in people's heads that just to say that the you can access the tool through your Scotland's Town Partnership website if people are wanting to have a little tour through it. Um, so we'll move on to the second speaker. So we're very pleased to be joined by Adjua Ofuri. Adjua is a postdoctoral researcher on a Coalesce project, an Irish Research Council Coalesce project called Citizen Rural. It's led by one of our working group on CFIT, um, Karen Keaveney, and also the co-principal investigator is Anua Gonzalez, who is a member of the Earth Institute. So Adjua's research interests include sustainability, community engagement, and land and rural livelihoods in Africa. She has a PhD in geography from Trinity, a master's in water and environmental management from Loughborough, and, project, and a master's in project management from the University of Greenwich. And Adjua, your, your PhD was, it examined the livelihood implications of large-scale land acquisitions within and across rural communities in the case study of Ghana. So yes. I think that you're going to tell us about the Citizen Rural Project basically today. So I'm going to hand over to you, Adjo. It's great. To, thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'll just share my screen. That's perfect. We can see that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I am presenting on. Um, Sorry, just a minute. I'm presenting on the rural digitalization and data. So what's the problem? And this um, is emerging from the Citizen Rural Project, which uh, investigates how rural populations can harness digital technologies to enhance participative democracy in the planning and policy formulation for local sustainable development. And um, on the screen there, you can see the research team as well as the um, project partners. So just to give you a bit of the background, so the perceived lack of digital data and technologies in remote rural areas and in rural settings um, has been identified as a challenge for rural communities. Now there is that um, global push for dig digitalization and this has highlighted some of the issues when it comes to rural decline and the rural urban divide. And the COVID-19 crisis also cast that light on the vulnerability of rural areas, um, particularly because they had poorer access to services and they had lower internet um, accessibility in terms of both coverage and speed. Now the COVID-19 crisis also um, generated that greater demand for digital accessibility. So digitalization of the rural and the application of digital data is a means by which digital technologies can be harnessed and can be used to transform. But the question is, can the rural fully embrace digital data and digitalization? And just taking a step back and looking a bit at the literature, um, there is a lot of academic literature on the decline of the rural. For example, Lee and Liu 2019 noted that um, expressions such as rural decline, marginal community, community distraction were put forward successively to describe the downward spiral of decreasing employment, population, quality of life in the countryside. And also um, in their research, Bell et al. 2010 puts the death of the rural into Google with uh, quotation marks in order to get um, exact hits, hits on the exact phrase. In 2008, they got 201,000 hits. Um, in 2010, they got 8.7 million hits. So they concluded that the talk of rural demise is coming in from all over the world. Now the COVID-19 pandemic, according to Whitaker 2021, has also um, cast that spotlight on the state of rural areas. And the pandemic brought with it that realization that um, there is the importance of um, broadband and those without such connections would be at a bigger disadvantage than in a non-socially distanced world. So um, 
Rural digitalization has, over the decades, emerged as one of the major solutions to rural decline and regeneration, according to Kawi 2020, Kawi et al. 2020. And the Bled Declaration also noted this, that the rural digital economy, if developed in an innovative way, um, had that potential to improve the life and quality of rural citizens. And the issue with the prevention has to do with, for example, the um, market-led rollout of the of broadband, the lack of critical mass of consumers in rural areas, the logistical challenges with infrastructure resulting from remoteness and topography. But digitalization is not about turning villages into large busy cities, but bridging that gap and um, easing the challenges of rural citizens' um, lives. So in um, this aspect of the research, we uh, conducted a number of high level semi-structured interviews with data and rural development experts from the public and private sectors. And we were exploring rural digitalization and what that meant in reality in rural geographies. And on the slide, you can see some of the um, organizations that we engaged with. And so our initial findings were uh, um, we classed them into four broad themes. And these were communities, data, digitalization, and definition of the rural. So taking that broad theme of communities, the initial findings um, had to do with access, awareness, skills, training, and the approach. Now, under um, the, the issue was that concerning the digital, what was the level of access that communities had to the digital? What level of awareness did communities have of the digital? And stemming from this, what could they achieve with the level of access and level of awareness that they had? And, and also in line with this was the issue of um, skills, education and training. What did they need in order to be able to access um, digital data in order to be able to access the digital. And then more importantly, from their perspective, were they content, were they um, satisfied with the status quo, that is with the amount of access that they had, was that sufficient to address their needs? Um, another finding had to do with the approach, a top-down approach versus a bottom-up approach, and which was more needed and more suitable. So where um, communities were concerned, what's the issue? Digitalization, can address issues within the rural, but then it depends on how it is shaped. Um, digitalization is usually viewed from the perspective of broadband and connectivity and perhaps needs to be expanded to um, community development. Then there's also that need, that um, um, point of community needs. That is the skills required to avail of the services that digitalization and digital data can provide. And that means that um, communities would need that necessary training and education and capacity. And when it comes to training, the question is um, training on what can be done with the data and engagement on exactly what, um, exactly what the rural citizens want. Um, where the approach is, is concerned, the, um, there is no one size fits all because um, of the nature of the rural. And I'll come to the definition of the rural a bit later. So um, the approach needs to be flexible and adaptable. Both a bo top down and bottom up approaches are needed because each brings something to the table. The second um, major um, overarching theme had to do with data and this was mainly from the point of view of the data experts versus the rural development experts. So according to the data experts, the data is available, for example, from the ordinance surveys, the national maps, um, taking the CSO, the OSI, the EPA, the national mapping agencies, for example. And with regards to coverage, the data has national coverage and is very locally relevant. So um, one interview, we noted that I don't think there's a real data gap. I think there's plenty of data. It's rich, it's available. It's very good quality data as well. But the rural development experts uh, beg to differ because in their opinion and from their perspective, there was not enough rural data. The data was disaggregated. There needed to be more data at rural levels, but that also brought into question um, the definition of the rural. There was that need for longitudinal data because the current data actually was too time bound and just provided snapshots in time. And then databases were too large. People live cross border, but data is divided at national and county levels. So, um, 
some interviewees noted that I think that the granularity of the data is the problem in Ireland. It's not flexible. Then there was the issue of community needs. And one um, interviewee noted that it's not enough to say the data is available. It's about how it should be used, what it should be used for. The community needs to know that so they can access it properly. Because if the community doesn't understand those elements, just making it available won't move the needle in any way. And with regards to coverage, um, it had more to do with the fact that there were national data sets with a local component as opposed to local data sets created and managed for local reasons. So where data and digital, sorry, digital data and digitalization is concerned, um, what's the issue? Um, it has the potential to transform. However, it's not just about the data being available. The issue is what is its use? Why does the rural citizen need it? How can the rural citizen access the data and use it um, appropriately? And the data sets may suit the well-informed citizen, but then the question is, what about the average person? Which brings up the issue of empowering the rural citizen. And this would be through making the data available in a user-friendly way and through education training in order to be able to access and use the data appropriately, to be able to use the tools appropriately, which also brings up the issue of design. Data sets need to be designed with and for communities, and they need to be shown how to understand and use it. And then also um, there was that, there is that aspect of the polarization in perspectives. That's the data experts versus rural development experts, which perhaps brings out that top-down versus bottom-up approaches and the need to bridge that divide. Um, the third um, overarching theme had to do with digitalization. And the issue was that um, mainly it was viewed from the point of connectivity, high speed, good speed, broadband and Wi-Fi. And it was more of being serving to give information. And notably, um, another finding was that most engagement was um, with, with public policy did not occur on a digital platform. And then there was also the issue of training and capacity, which I think you can see runs right through all the themes and uh, that digital literacy skills are based on demographic factors and are very um, essential. Then there was the question of full digitalization. Is this possible? Can there be full digitalization and what was preventing it? So with digitalization, um, it is um, digitalization of the rural is essential, but it's about how it is shaped and tailored to the rural communities and the community needs. Because if it's not shaped well, it can actually exacerbate that divide between groups So in, in society. So for example, there's that need to address digital literacy skills. And digitalization is also, should also be used to supplement and not replace because of the significance of the social where the rural um, is concerned. So um, one um, interviewee noted, like I was saying that um, it's good, but it should supplement, not replace because the very essence of rural is that social construct. And also a rural community is a cluster of things, shops, businesses, schools, so digitalization, that bucket of digitalization should have these different components that feed all of those things that are in the community, tailored to them, tailored to what the community needs. Um, the other aspect is, has to do with community um, participation. Digitalization should be used as a tool to enable participation, encourage participation and enable community development. So, um, one um, um, interviewee noted that they, we are supposed to be making those decisions. We decide on the things we think are important and by we, I'm talking about our communities. And in order to address uh, the issue of embracing digitalization, can there be full digitalization? It's about um, taking advantage and making good use of connectivity, but this needs to be accompanied by community development and digital skills for the literacy skills for the individual, but also capacity within institutions. Um, the final overarching theme that um, we came across in, in our findings had to do with the definition of the rural, because this came up quite a lot. And um, definitions, are, there are different definitions based on the focus. There are different levels of rurality. There are a variety of rural types. And different definitions are also based on the different agencies. Hence, um, 
there is no perfect definition of the rural that meets all purposes. So then the question that the Food and Agricultural Organization would ask is um, how to choose a definition. And they answer by saying that it depends on the purpose for which the definition is sought. The literature talks about the fact that um, there's the agreement that the choice or construction of definition should be relevant or based on the purpose of the activity or application. And it's incumbent upon the particular research to include um, the specific definition and clearly define how um, rurality is operationalized within their work, according to Bennett et al. 2019. So um, can the rural um, fully embrace digital data and digitalization? Now, our findings um, noted that um, although digitalization has the potential to transform rural communities, um, this transformation is dependent on a number of factors. So um, the shaping of the agenda, how it is shaped needs to be examined. It needs to be tailored to community needs. For example, addressing of digital literacy um, skills gaps. And the community needs to be an integral part of the process. Their awareness, their level of access, um, level of capacity, education, training, and more importantly, exactly what they want um, needs to be part of the, the discussion. And that brings up the issue of community participation and in these issues that affects them. And finally, um, the process needs to be flexible, it needs to be an adaptable, flexible and co-designed approach. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Adjua. It's an incredible amount of work has been achieved on that project. It seems like it only started yesterday. Is it, is it a year into? Yes, about a year. About, about a year. Yeah, you seem to have a really, developing a really good picture of the complexity of the issue of digitalization in the rural. Um, so we, we'll move on quick. Thank you for that. We're going to move on quickly to our next speaker, which is Dominic Fahey. So we've started off looking at how um, things are, a system is up and running in terms of data in another place. And then we've looked at a, a research project that is looking at the complexity on the ground of trying to um, build the, the digitalization of the rural. And we're now going to move into a, an Irish established uh, data set. Um, I hope, Dominic, now that your data set meets all those criteria that Adjur was talking about on that last slide. There's five pillars now to, to take into account. Yeah, I've so, seen that. That's a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> noted, noted them down. Okay, so Dominic, um, Dominic is Chief Technology Officer in GeoDirectory. So GeoDirectory, I'm sure most people are aware, it's been established around 20 odd years at this stage, and it's a collaboration between AMPOST yeah. and OSI, Ordnance Survey Ireland. So you're merging all this intimate knowledge of postal operatives who are going to all these buildings on a regular basis, um, so they know these buildings well, and then the, the sort of the legacy and the resources of OSI, which of course go back into the early to mid 1800s. Um, so Dominic, you're a, a qualified systems analyst. You've got qualifications in cartography, GIS um, from UCC and strategic leadership from the Institute of Leadership and Management in London. Um, and you've had various roles in OnPost, OSI and GeoDirectory prior to this current role, which I don't know how long you've been in, to, in, in that role um, as Chief Technology Office or Officer. Um, and the subject of Dominic's talk today is clever play on words and um, building insights. So Dominic, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Um, I'm coming at this from a data, a data provider's point of view. And yeah, I was a play on words on building insights. It refers to a physical building, but also building a, a picture around that. So I'll just kick off. So a quick overview. I'm going to look at the currency, accuracy, and completeness of our data, what services and products we provide, and a little look at what reports we produce on a biannual basis. So our overview. So we're the experts in location-based data. We're in the market now for more than 23 years. We provide a wide range of data products and services, and we're the name behind many Irish business successes. A lot of people may not have heard of us, but we do provide 
critical support to cross sector of Irish industry. So that's our structure. We are partly owned by Ordnance Sorby Ireland, who were rebranded yesterday to Tulcha, where they've merged with the valuation, property registration, and themselves, and on post. And on post is the Irish National Postal Service. So we're owned by those two well established companies. And we were brought together, and Geodirectory was created because of a lack of information and data for those two organizations. And then it quickly realized that this information could be used in a wider um, area. So who are our customers? Well, as I said, we're across all the sectors of Irish business, from board gas, broadband, local government, central government, uh, UCD is a lecture or use it in their lectures and our customers as well. But we are the database behind air codes and air codes is the postcode for the Republic of Ireland. So an address cannot appear or cannot get an air code unless it first appears in geodirectory. So we are an infrastructural tool that's been used widely. Okay, so why would you use geodirectory or why would you use data anyway? And an survey that we did was that 88% of companies report that an increase or an inaccuracy in the data has a direct impact on their bottom line. So there's a financial incentive to use current, accurate and complete data. And if 88% say that that has an impact on their bottom line, well, that's one incentive, but there's many incentives to using data. This was a survey we did of our customers, how they're using our data. And top of the list, 88, 86% say they're using our data for planning and strategic decision-making. And that's very important to us. Like we, as I say, we have an address database, we have addresses, we have other information, but the fact that most of our customers are using it in a decision and strategic way uh, is very pleasing and it keeps us on our toes. So who's using it? Some real world examples. We're in the blue light uh, industry, the ambulance service, fire brigades, the Gardaí all have our data in their command and control centers. So they're using it to validate incoming calls, where it's coming from uh, and where the address is. A business to consumer industry, Domino's Pizzas, they want to deliver their pizzas to a location. They use us for that purposes. So it makes the delivery more efficient and the customer gets their pizza a little bit hotter, I hope. And a local authority, Waterford County Council have it, and they've done some wonderful things with our data. May not sound exciting, but they reduced bin lorries from three to two. But that is an enormous saving for a local authority. It's more efficient. Uh, they've taken one lorry off the road, and they're very, very happy with that return. They use it in their planning. Again, planning department look at submissions for new planning. Uh, their local authority planning plans and you know it's it's used quite across the whole local authority but they're quite happy and quite proud that they use it in their planning for validation and they also use it to maintain the electoral register housing data and rated property information and, and a lot more it's used right across the organizations so how do we maintain our data and i think we all talked about data in our presentations and the importance of data being current accurate and complete so how do we do it we're a buildings database so i we have information about every building in the republic of ireland that can or does receive mail so we have the address the address is one attribute of a building and you may see here that we break the address down into its components so if you want to do some analysis, you can do it at the building level. You can do it at the street level or at the locality level or the county level or at small area. So you can do it at whatever level you deem fit for your requirements. So we've broken the address down. And because we're a geocoded address database, we know where that address is. We've tied that attribute to a physical building and the location of that building. So we know where that building is on the ground, on the surface of the earth, when we're talking about either checking the address or what other attributes for that building we may require. And then we tie into three and a half thousand postal delivery staff. We have 31 full-time staff in on post and Ordnance Survey Ireland 
they supply their ground surveyors and four, four full-time operational staff. And we have 12 staff in GeoDirectory tying it all together. So how do we maintain it? It's a multifaceted approach. We do desktop interviews with the three and a half thousand delivery staff. We do ground validation. We use commencement notices. We talk to local developers. We talk to local authorities and we get feedback from our customers or other uh, interested parties. So what services and data do we provide? So I'm gonna look at it just a couple. I'm not gonna spend much time on the services, but we have an API where you can plug our database directly into your call centers or point to contact with your customers. And that validates the address, but it also allows you to do a number of things. Once you've validated the address, you can geocode the address on the fly. You can add an air code on the fly, or you can add some boundary information about that address. We have an address, an automated address cleaning, where you upload your existing address database and we clean it. And now you can order data online. But I suppose the real interesting thing about today's uh, presentation is about some of our data. Now we have a suite of products, so I'm not gonna go into them all, but I think there's two products which are very relevant to today's discussion. So I'm gonna deal with those two products. So our first product is Geo Building Intel. Now, as I said at the outset, we are a buildings database. So we want to capture all the information we can about the building and the address is one attribute. So what is it? It's a holistic view of the building. And I say it's every building in the Republic of Ireland that can or does receive mail. It's the most comprehensive building intelligence available. Th that's our belief. And we uh, what I'm saying here is that we're not manufacturing all this data, but we want to become a one-stop shop for data around every building in the Republic of Ireland. So what are we including? As well as the address, as well as the location, as well as the air codes, as well as the boundary, the Minister of Boundary sets, we're adding extra value here. So we're adding building height, the ground height, square areas, number of floors, building use and unit use, estimated rebuild costs, estimated bedrooms, bathrooms, estimated bear rating, uh, price of the last time the residential building was sold, and the building age. This is not exhaustive. This is where we are today, and we're building on this. It's a live product, and what we do is add as much information about every building we can. So what's coming up? Landslide risks, red on gas, roof type, soil type, flood risk, crime. Now we've just recently added the red on gas risk to the building and the soil type. They are now available in this product. Landslide is ready to go. Flood risks, is, yeah, we're, we're working on that. Once we get the floodplain boundary set, we'll bring that in. So we want to become a one-stop shop for all the information about every building in Ireland. And the second product I want to talk about is GeoPeople. So what is GeoPeople? It's a holistic view of the neighborhood. We've got the building. Now we want to know what's the view of the neighborhood? What's the neighborhood like? And again, that ties into our two previous presentations about the value of data and analyze what data sets you have. It's intelligence extracted from CSO, publicly available data no personal data obviously in it but what we've done is we've looked at this the data sets available from uh, CSO and we've looked at how useful all the different breakdowns were and going to our customers they came back and said CSO is a fabulous data set nobody would ever dispute that but to make it more useful to SMEs and to smaller companies and smaller businesses they felt that it could be reduced to the number of categories. So we come up with five categories and we subdivided them. So we have 14 divides rather than the, all the divides that CSO have. So how did we get there? We worked with Jonathan. He's the expert on social demographic and deprivation indexing. We use the existing HP small area deprivation, uh, deprivation index. Now P there is Jonathan. Jonathan's one of the original authors of that deprivation index. We calculated at the small area level. I, I'm assuming everybody here would know what the small area geography is. 
So we're producing these statistics at the small area, same as CSO, but just we've simplified it, we believe, as based on census data. And all addresses in the small area share the same category. So we're not, a, we're anonymized as the CSO have done the data to the small area data set. And as I said, we have, we have our five clear definitions. And what we've done is we've subdivided into affluent, advantaged, striving, struggling, and deprived. There are my five main categories and we subdivided them into another two or three, depending on the category. So there's the extract, right? So there we have it. The, that's the small areas. You can see on the right, the map where they actually are. And down at the bottom, they're the key statistics, the age groups, married, employed, home ownership, and social housing and the breakdown for each small area. So that's one example. And the other one then is this one, is uh, rural. Again, it's key statistics, and if you look at the map, it'll show you where the distribution of that category is. So those two products fit together seamlessly as they do with all our other products, but now, Instead of just looking at the address for the building, we're now building a profile of the building and we're building a profile of the neighborhood. And again, that analysis can be done at street level, small area level, town level, county level, or at country level. The other thing I'd like to just touch on today is our reports. GeoDirectory produces two reports biannually, twice a year. And it would be of interest to the audience, I think, here today. What we have is on our GeoDirectory website, we have a knowledge center, and these reports are available for anyone to download and read. Now we do two reports, one on commercial buildings and one on residential buildings. Uh, these reports are being widely quoted uh, and they are being used at local level for analyzing things, uh, trends, I suppose I should say. Again, we just did a report there uh, Tuesday we got great national coverage um, quoted on RT.ie and a number of other uh, main uh, broad uh, platforms. Um, but RT.ie have acknowledged that GeoDirectory is Ireland's, Ireland's official complete database of commercial and residential buildings. And we are being quoted now more and more in the political arena as well as commercial. But we have been up to now quite in the background of a lot of these large companies. So what do the reports show? Well, they look at under construction, vacant, derelict, new addresses, property prices, and just as important for analysis, it shows the trends. You know, as are the vacant properties going up, going down, derelict the same, and the trend in property price. There's the extract uh, for vacant last year, quarter two, 2022. Look at Dublin, top of the list, 1.3% vacancy rate, but Leitrim is 12.8. Probably no surprise that the more rural the county, the higher the vacancy rate. But again, it's showing you that for the entire country and you can follow the trends monthly or bi-monthly. So just to sum up, GeoDirectory allows you to build insights, and again, pun on build, building, and makes informed decisions around planning and strategic decision-making. Now, it's a lot more than that, obviously, because we're in the, the broadband rollout, we're in you know, all the service industries, or all the service provisions, local government, central government. But again, we're pitching ourselves at strategic uh, uh, planning and at that level of interaction. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'd like to invite you all to our annual conference in the Aviva Stadium if you'd like to follow up on that or anything or have a come and talk to us. We have a great day out on Thursday the 27th in the Aviva Stadium. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dominic. That was a, a great um, whistle-stop tour again through all the work that GeoDirectory is doing and, and there's a date for our diaries. I'm, I'm